Hey, welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Jordi Ramirez. Since the 2024 election is a year away from now, I thought that I would bring up something that has not been on the radar lately. Third parties. Or more specifically, No Labels. A politically centrist organization that claims not to be a political party, but if you've been keeping up with the news, it's basically trying to be a spoiler party for the incumbent president. There have been a lot of challenges for President Biden lately that I know of. But, even though there are people that are passing on him because of his age and the crises that's surrounding him, such as the war in Ukraine and Israel right now, there is nothing that I think is more threatening to him politically than third-party candidates that are challenging the president when the country is still not living in its normal times and that this is not the time nor the place to get involved in third parties. I mean, you have Cornell West running as an independent, challenging the president, as well as RFK Jr. Even Dean Phillips from Minnesota is challenging the president in a Democratic primary. But there is nothing more deadly in terms of third parties than no labels. No Labels, which has been a political organization in D.C. since 2010, has now taken a risky, if not dangerous, step of entering the election cycle. Since the current president has been met with low approval ratings in a few years, it should be no surprise that a centrist organization that is well-funded thinks that the solution to voters' problems is trying to put two candidates from opposing parties for their presidential ticket. During the summer, investigative journalist David Korn of Mother Jones put out a report about the organization's donors. Since the organization refused to disclose who was funding them, the report gave a clue as to some of its donors, including Michael Smith, the founder of Freeport LNG, a natural gas giant. He donated to Mitch McConnell's super PAC of $5.5 million and backed Glenn Youngkin when he was running for governor of Virginia. Or Tom McInerney, who had contributed nearly $100,000 to the RNC and over $200,000 to the NRCC. Another donor is Harlan Crow, who is currently tied to the scandal relating to the Supreme Court since he is a wealthy benefactor of Clarence Thomas. However, there has been one group that has been putting all the stops at stopping no labels from putting their thumb on the scale for next year's presidential election, and that group is Third Way a centrist organization that has been putting out a series of memos on their websites of the dangers that No Labels poses. A recent memo from the group outlined what No Labels is planning on doing that would make next year's election the last free and fair one. According to the most recent memo from Third Way, since they launched their third-party presidential effort last year, the No Labels Party has repeated a central refrain, our bipartisan ticket led either by a Democrat or a Republican will not be a spoiler, we are in this to win. But that has now changed. No Labels has made clear that their new plan is to put a Republican at the top of their ticket, and because they can't win the presidency outright, they've indicated that their intention now is to exercise leverage over the winner by denying both major parties 270 electoral college votes. Their radical new plan would ensure a second Trump term. The new plan that was pieced together by Third Way outlines that No Labels wants to force a contingent election in the 2024 presidential election, which has not been in recent memory since the last one in 1836. Exhibit A. No Labels' bid would block the incumbent from winning the swing states that he needs for his re-election. No Labels' poll shows that Biden is in a close two-way race in the key states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Nevada, and North Carolina within a margin of error. However, according to No Labels' data, if they put a Democrat or a Republican at the top of their ticket, Trump would win the election. Exhibit B. No label said the quiet part out loud according to the New York Times that they intend to pick a Republican. The New York Times reported that CEO Nancy Jacobson has told potential donors and allies that the no labels candidate will be a moderate Republican.
This is Jordan Ramirez, and you are listening to Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez. And now, here is my latest film review. My film review for this episode is Dinner in America, released in 2020, directed by Adam Ray Mayer, starring Kyle Gallner and Emily Skaggs. Here is the synopsis of the film. Simon, played by Kyle Gallner, is a punk rocker on the lam from the authorities and needs to find a way to make money for his punk rock band's album. Patty, played by Emily Skaggs, is an awkward college dropout bullied by jocks and works at a pet store. Patty is obsessed with the punk rock group and their music. When Simon needs a place to crash to get away from the cops, he ends up at Patty's place. Things start out awkward, but sooner rather than later, they start to fall in love. So what do I think of this film? I love watching this film. To me, it is the perfect alternative romantic comedy that was not only purely original, but also is quirky, fun, darkly humorous, and the characters on screen were a lot of fun to watch. The performances of Emily Skeggs and Kyle Gallner stood out for me as I watched it from beginning to end. Gallner's performance as a rebellious, transgressive youth who was on his own performing for his punk rock band, while at the same time trying to figure out ways to make money for his band's albums. On the outside, he displays a tough exterior, but he is also affectionate as his character evolves throughout the story. Emily Skeggs' performance as Patty, the socially inept and awkward college dropout who works at a pet shop and is the subject of harassment from the high school jocks, is pretty amazing to watch. In the beginning, she is unattractive and is a misfit who has no personality or charisma. But the moment that she starts listening to punk rock music, she starts to loosen up and show her bad side. I mean, her character goes through a physical transformation from being an unattractive person to being abrasive and extroverted as a punk rocker. As the two of them on screen together feel misplaced, they do at times feel like an odd couple, but... As the story develops, Simon decides to help Patty by loosening up her personality and helping her find her confidence and strength to get back at those who have mocked or criticized her in an aggressive but anarchic way. I feel like that these types of comedies that start out as awkward and mismatched and suddenly leans into something that is truly natural and melts your heart during the near end of the film, that is something that I believe is missing in today's Hollywood films since major studios today wouldn't go that far. But this is something that I feel was made just for me. It's a story of misfits going against societal norms in a decaying part of Americana that feels underrepresented, but also shows warmth and care. When it comes to the subgenre of the coming-of-age story, I feel that there should be more of these types of stories that don't have a voice in the cinematic world. The cinematography by Jean-Philippe Bernier is a plus for this film. His use of wide-angle lenses is perfect to show off the landscape of the decaying Midwest suburbs in Michigan. It's useful in the wide shots for the location sequences. There is also a great amount of depth and space with the medium and close-up shots that show a great symmetry in the conversation scenes between the characters throughout the film. And the zoom-in shots are also effective, whether it's for action or reactionary effect. One of the motifs that I noticed watching this film is the symbolic image of the American flag and its colors. Patty's shirt has an American flag, the front of her house has a basketball hoop with red, white, and blue along with the small flags next to the garage. In the drugstore there is an American flag sticker at the arcade, little American flags, and even in the beginning and end credits it is the usage of these three colors that is noticeable. One of the main themes watching this film is the decaying American dream, or the disillusionment of the American dream, that ties in with the motif of the American flag that I mentioned before. It shows that there is an ugly and unnatural side within the United States that is underneath the suburbs, right before our eyes. The film originally started out as two different script ideas that Adam Ray Mayer developed between 2006 and 2009. The first was Kicks from 2006, in which Simon had to volunteer for different clinical trials to get money for his punk records. The second was Dinner in America from 2009, and focused on Patty's family with a quirky and offbeat comedic approach as they have dinner. When Ray Mayer realized that the two sketches didn't work independently, he decided to combine the two stories around 2013 or 2014. He stated that he drew inspiration from Welcome to the Dollhouse and Napoleon Dynamite for its misfit characters. Don Wiener, and the title character in the latter film. I wouldn't say that they were really direct influences. I think really it came down to writing things that weren't going anywhere and just having like a lot of marinating over a long period of time. Once the script took shape, it attracted the attention of the late film director, Danny Lehner. 
the man behind Dude, Where's My Car, and Harold and Kumar Go to White Castle. Fleener was interested in directing the film, but after meeting with the writer, he decided to stay on the project as producer. He remained instrumental in the first year or so, and then he got sick, and by the end of the production, we lost him. After the passing of Danny Leaner, Ben Stiller and Nicky Weinstock brought the film back on track with their production companies as they came on board after filming was completed. They were so helpful in opening a lot of doors for us. They guided us like spirit animals. Nicky was on set for the entire film, so just having him there with his experience was awesome. I can't thank them enough for making this happen. The casting of the two leads, Kyle Gallner and Emily Skeggs, as well as the ensemble cast of the film was announced in 2018. Filming took place in Detroit around the same time as the cast announcement. Emily Skanks called the experience of working on this film one of my favorite things I've ever made. I had the best time making it, and it was like summer camp. I have really, really deep, happy, and nostalgic feelings for this movie. Kyle Gallner recollected how he was approached to this project. I actually got sent the script probably around two years before we even made it. I read for another movie that Ross Putnam, who produced this film, was producing. I didn't get it, but he really liked me. And he said, hey, can I send you the script? He emailed me the script when I was in the middle of filming a TV show, and I had two new babies. I read like 10 pages and just never got back to it. Cut to two years later, I'm filming another movie. The DP who shot Dinner in America, Sean Philip Bernier, was shooting this other project. Dinner in America was supposed to go with another cast, but they dropped out and it fell apart. And JP was like, there's a movie you'd be really good for. And he started talking about it. Something clicked, and I was like, this sounds super familiar. I just typed Dinner in America into my email, and I still had it. I read the script that night, and it just was wild. The first ten minutes is me smashing the window, you know what I mean? There's just so much chaos that I'm like, how did I not make it through? But that's what exhaustion will do to you, and having kids. I reached out to my reps, and I was like, can you connect me with Adam? It was the script initially that really set me off on it. It's really original. The characters are really interesting. It definitely creates its own world, and it marches to its own beat. Then I met Adam, and we Skyped for like three hours, just hearing him talk about the world he wanted to build and these characters, what he's been doing to work on it and create it, and just who he was. That was the final box for me. I was like, I want to make this movie with that guy. Emily Skeggs, in that same interview, described the on-screen chemistry between her and Kyle Gallner as their characters. I don't think Patty would be Patty without Simon in any way, shape, or form, and vice versa. They very much only exist in each other's worlds, and I think the kind of beautiful thing about this movie is seeing these two people who are seemingly so wrong for each other actually be perfect for each other. They collide in this chaotic way that's really exciting and really true to life. I feel like this is how a lot of people fall in love. They meet that person and they're like, what? And then they're like, oh, that was really fun. And I think for both of us, these characters are really personal. They're very much different facets and shades of who we are, or who we were at a certain point in our lives. For me, Patty's very personal. She's kind of like me, stripped down before I learned how to be a proper person in society, before I gained confidence and knew my place in the world and my value. Those are all the things that Patty's looking for, and Simon helps her find them. That's a universal thing for a lot of people. They want to find their place and their people, and I just love the movie so much for that. I'm so thrilled that we're getting it out there. Adam Ray Mayer and Emily, along with Kyle Gallner, wrote a couple of original songs ahead of production before filming began. One of those songs that it was co-written by Adam Ray Mayer with Emily Skaggs is the song Watermelon. The film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival on January 24, 2020 in the U.S. Dramatic Competition. It had a limited release in select theaters across the United States on May 27, 2022. It received a number of accolades from different film festivals, including Sundance. This is an amazing film, not just for its performances and songs, but also for its writing, directions, editing, cinematography, costuming, and production design that I think some audiences have missed this perfect opportunity to watch. I don't think of this as a romantic comedy film, but to me, it feels like a Thanksgiving film. I mean, the film has food, family, and football. It's raw and energetic, but it also has warmth, humor, action, and music that would make you wish that you were in the punk rock scene, while also having a great time. To paraphrase John Waters, it is the perfect Thanksgiving movie to be appalled by. 
That, by the way, is a compliment. And speaking of John Waters, he called this film a wonderfully nasty, politically incorrect punk rock romantic comedy with great performances that somehow got cancelled when it was screened at Sundance in 2020. Finally, it was released this year and nobody in the US seemed to notice except director Sean Baker, who sent me a screener for which I'm eternally grateful. We will be right back with my segment, Allow Me to Explain. Next week, the Senate Judiciary Committee, led by Dick Durbin, will take its first step of subpoenaing Harlan Crow and Leonard Leo over their extremely lavish and extravagant gifts to Supreme Court Justices Samuel Alito and Clarence Thomas that was not financially disclosed. So, with that in mind, what is the next step for enforcing the Code of Ethics in the Supreme Court? It's time for Allow Me to Explain. The U.S. Supreme Court in recent years has had low approval ratings at 38% the lowest in which the majority of Americans show no sign of trust or confidence for the highest court in the land. The Supreme Court already started its term last month, and already some of the cases involve disability rights, voting rights, CFPB, social media, and worker rights. So, with that in mind, one would have to wonder how this all began. Well, to start off, we have to go back to when this all began. It all started back in 2012 when Senator Durbin urged Chief Justice Roberts to establish an enforceable ethics code. The Chief Justice refused at the time, and with that came a series of reports in which the justices have accepted lavish gifts from wealthy donors that were undisclosed. There is not a full scope of how these benefactors gained private access to these justices. The information was leaked to the public thanks to reporting from ProPublica, which was in full detail about Justice Thomas's benefactor Harlan Crow and the amount of lavish gifts and trips that he spent that were not disclosed to the Senate. Some examples include flying on Crow's jet, vacationing on his yacht, and going to a private resort on the Adirondacks owned by Harlan Crow. Once the report was published and out in public, Senator Durbin, along with Senate Judiciary Democrats, sent a letter to Chief Justice Roberts to investigate Justice Thomas's gifts that were undisclosed and to take action on April 10th. The committee received a response from the Secretary of the Judicial Conference of the United States, which states that the Senator's April 10th letter was referred to the Judicial Conference and forwarded to the Judicial Conference Committee on Financial Disclosure on April 21st. On April 20th, Senator Durbin invited the Chief Justice to testify before the committee in relation to the ethics of the Supreme Court. On April 25th, the Chief Justice declined the invitation. On April 27th, Senator Durbin led a full committee letter to the Chief Justice seeking additional information on the court's statements on ethics. On May 2nd, Senator Durbin had a full committee hearing on Supreme Court ethics reform. On May 8th, Senator Durbin and the Senate Judiciary Democrats sent a letter to Harlan Crow seeking information on gifts and travel given to Justice Thomas. On May 22nd, the committee received a response from a law firm representing Crow in response. Here is an excerpt from Senator Durbin's statement following the response from the law firm representing Harlan Crow. Harlan Crow believes the secrecy of his lavish gifts to Justice Thomas is more important than the reputation of the highest court of law in this land. He is wrong. The committee will respond more fully to this letter in short order and will continue to seek a substantive response to our information request in order to craft and advance the targeted ethics legislation needed to help restore trust in the Supreme Court. As I've said many times before, the Chief Justice has the power to establish a credible, enforceable code of conduct for the court today. However, if the court will not act, this committee will. On May 26th, Senators Durbin and Whitehouse sent a follow-up letter to Crow refuting his reasoning for noncompliance, which received a clear, unwarranted refusal on June 5th. October 5th, Senator Durbin and the majority of Senate Judiciary Democrats sent a letter to Harlan Crow that rejects Crow's separation of powers defense, as well as his proposal to provide only partial information to the committee. On May 17th, White House held a subcommittee hearing on judicial ethics processes at the Judicial Conference. On July 10th, Senators Durbin and White House announced a vote for the Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act. The legislation would require Supreme Court justices to adopt a code of conduct, create a mechanism to investigate alleged violations of the code of conduct and other laws, improve disclosure and transparency when a justice has a connection to a party or amicus before the court, and required justices to explain their recusal discussions to the public. 
On July 11th, Senators Durbin and Whitehouse sent a letter to the Supreme Court Historical Society. On August 7th, SCHS provided a partial production, and on September 9th, SCHS completed their production. On that same day, Senators Durbin and Whitehouse sent letters to Leonard Leo, Robin Arkley, and Paul Singer. It was in response to a report by ProPublica that found these three billionaires gave lavish gifts to Justice Alito that he failed to disclose. Alito's billionaire-funded vacation in the report was planned and attended by Leonard Leo, the co-founder of the Federalist Society. Leo and Singer submitted responses refusing to comply on July 25th. Singer submitted a limited response on August 14th. On October 5th, Senator Durbin and the Senate Judiciary Democrats sent letters rejecting their separation of powers defense. On July 20th, the SCERT Act advanced out of committee. On August 3rd, Senator Durbin and other Democratic members of the Judiciary Committee sent a letter to Chief Justice Roberts urging him to ensure Alito's recusal in Moore v. United States. On September 8th, Justice Alito put out a response in which he states that he refuses to recuse himself from this case. On September 14th, Senators Whitehouse and Durbin sent letters to Paul Novelli and David Sokol. The letters were in response to news reporting from ProPublica in which Justice Thomas didn't just receive lavish gifts from Harlan Crow, but also from two other wealthy benefactors, Paul Novelli, an oil baron, and David Sokol, a former top executive at Berkshire Hathaway that were also not disclosed. On September 22nd, Senator Durbin called for Justice Thomas to recuse himself from the Loper Bright Enterprises v. Raimondo case. This comes after reporting from ProPublica detailing Justice Thomas's participation participation in donor summits organized by right-wing billionaires Charles and David Koch. In an excerpted statement, Durbin said, The Koch network has invested tremendous capital to overturn long-standing legal precedent known as Chevron deference, which would handcuff regulators and serve the interests of corporate fat cats. As more details are revealed of Justice Thomas's undisclosed involvement with the Koch political network, there are serious questions about his impartiality in cases squarely confronting the Chevron doctrine. For these reasons, I am calling on Justice Thomas to recuse himself from consideration of Loper Bright versus Raimondo. So now that we have a timeline of what happened, here are some of the updates regarding the vote on the subpoenas regarding the wealthy benefactors that is seen as the end game right here. On October 30th of this week, Senators Durbin and Whitehouse made an announcement on the vote to authorize subpoenas for Harlan Crow, Leonard Leo, and Robin Arkley, related to Supreme Court ethics reform. On November 2nd, at the Senate Judiciary Committee, Senator Durbin unveiled the subpoena authorization during their business meeting. Now, while it sounds like good news, however, there will be a major clash between the Democrat and Republican members of this committee. What I encourage for my listeners is very simple. By calling your senators from the Judiciary Committee and letting them know how you feel when it comes to the ethics of the Supreme Court that is long overdue. I know that it feels like a losing battle at this point, but as Senator Durbin said, this is just one step out in terms of holding the Supreme Court accountable for its inability to enforce its own code of ethics. This has been Allow Me to Explain. On the next episode of Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez, it's a Jordan Ramirez minisode. Jordan Ramirez recommends The King and the Mockingbird, directed by Paul Grimald from 1980, airing Monday at 12 p.m. on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. You have been listening to Film Talk with Jordan Ramirez. This series is now available to listen to at 4 p.m. on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public every Friday. And my mini-sodes, Jordan Ramirez recommends every Monday at 12 p.m. on Anchor, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. And just as a reminder to make sure to like and subscribe to my podcast on Spotify. Make sure to go to my blog website at filmtalkwithjordanramirezpodcast.wordpress.com with my latest podcast episode on the page labeled Episodes. You can contact me on my social media feeds such as LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. I am also available on Letterboxd. Check out my YouTube channel as well, Film Talk with Jordi Ramirez, and make sure to like and subscribe. If there is a film that you recommend that I would put for my next review, make sure to submit it to my social media accounts, and if you're lucky, make sure that you also recommend your favorite film and also put out your audition video on 
Instagram or on YouTube to make sure that you appear as a guest star on my next episode on a video podcast, special video podcast anyway, a special video podcast episode of Film Talk with Jordi Ramirez. And until then, I'll see you at the movies.